I don't trust technology. So I always had a backup. That's <laughs> one of my first statements to students. Always, always have a backup. When we, when I met with colleagues and I was giving webinars and all of that, I always use uh, my laptop and another laptop and you know, just to make sure that if I'm in a webinar or if I'm talking with my students, wherever something happens, I have another machine. And my colleagues were like, ah, oh, this is the, now they call it the Nadia insurance or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrific. <laughs> I don't know why, I, I, I thought it was super obvious, you know, like when you have a lot, you, you never know what could happen with the technology. So you must have some, especially when you're with students and students will panic if you disappear and they're online and they don't know where to go, how to, you know. So I was, I thought it was obvious, but apparently no. So now at University Laval, there's Nadia Insurance there. So people See, know that, that alone will have a huge impact on your institution, <laughs> really. Especially now, you know, when during in the next couple of years, I think many people are going to become familiar with online instruction. And the impression that they have is going to be very durable. It's hard to overcome people's initial negative impressions of things. Yeah, absolutely. First of all, what are your thoughts on, on what's happening? Well, you know, it's always tempting when something terrible happens to make the point that uh, there's a great opportunity here. But I, I genuinely believe that. And the opportunity, I believe, is the following. And, and this comes from a person who, is, who has been a professor for 45 to 50 years in many different universities. And I've held appointments in three different areas, medicine, uh, education, and psychology. So I've seen it up front for a very long time. And one thing I know is that universities are full of extraordinary scholars in disciplines. But just because someone is appointed a professor in a discipline doesn't mean they know how to teach that discipline. But I think there's a general assumption on the part of a lot of faculty that knowing something about their field is equivalent to knowing something about how to teach it. It's not. I'm sorry, it's not. And the lucky part of our life in universities is that we admit such bright students that they find a way to learn despite how they're taught most of the time. Now, that is not to say there aren't absolutely amazing teachers in universities, and there are. And, and my guess is that everybody that might be listening to this has experienced one or two of those people. But I ask you to go back to the average and realize how much effort you had to spend to learn much of anything, despite what was going on in the course. So what we can do here, in my view, is to try to help faculty, particularly those who are most willing to participate, to collaborate, let's say, to become better instructors, or to be more willing to collaborate with people who know something about instruction and learning. Because that's what we're hoping for here, is more of a collaboration on the part of people in instructional technology with people on the faculty. Now, I actually worked with a number of universities that have been trying to do this over the years, none of them in the context of this terrible virus, this pandemic. But universities were at the highest level, the, the provost of the university, the executive presidents, the vice presidents, the academic officers are all committed to doing better job at teaching and at even in distance learning. And the difficulties have been enormous. So I think there's a great resistance on the part of faculty to get a lot of faculty to getting the idea that they really do need and could learn a huge amount more about how to teach what they know in a way that would make it so possible for even their brightest students to learn faster, to learn more, to be more capable to use what they learn later on. So how do we do that? Yeah. Uh, that's the real question. And I, I think there are a number of ways, um, but I start out by my own experiences that finding faculty who are really flexible and open to collaborations like this, who are willing to think of their own contribution as the knowledge from their discipline, and to think of needing the, the contribution of colleagues on how to teach that knowledge online. Uh, that to me is the way that you start out. In other words, try to grant money and resources to people in different disciplines 
uh, a select number, let's say, in a university. So you can generate examples for faculty who might be less open to the idea, for example. Uh, and the choice of the people that you work with I th is very important. And not only do they have to be well known in their field, I think, but they also have to be considered to be colleagues who are trustworthy, colleagues who faculty might go to for advice. Um, and those people exist in universities in almost in many fields, not all fields, but most, I think. Um, and then do your best with those faculty. Uh, invest, try, and, and by the way, be able to show before and after, but also be able to show the benefits of the collaboration, not only in terms of what it looks like on the screen and in a course, but the experience the students have. I think that's very critical is to be able to not only think of faculty as involved in this, but students need to be involved also. What's their impression? Not just their learning, which is critical. Are they actually learning? Are they learning fast? Are they, uh, what's their test uh, scores and so on and so forth? But also what's their, how do they feel about this experience? Do they like it? Do they, what's their advice about it? What don't they like? What could be improved? I think building in not only more information for faculty, but bringing students into the collaboration and getting their advice on what works for them. You know, in, in a way, I, I actually think I've learned as much from students about learning and teaching as I've learned from research. You know, a huge amount. If you're open to have them tell you that something's not working, if you're open to actually consider that and try something different, a whole new world opens up for you as a faculty member. Absolutely. And so I always want with these people that I work with as, as uh, uh, coming to the fore and trying to revise their course in a way that it not only fits the online technology, but also so fits with what we know about the architecture of people's minds, their cognition, what we know about research on learning and instruction and so on. Yeah, but the problem is that one of the things that uh, the centers are saying is that usually you have a couple of courses that need to be revamped, right? And they have the, 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 the team to do that. But now it's really all courses that need to be changed. And there are not enough people to, to give support to everyone. So they're trying their best to at least accompany people who are, you know, like who are struggling with some aspects. But how can they scale up? their support? How can they scale up, you know, like these interactions with, with, um, with faculty members? One of the universities I spoke with, uh, Carleton University, they have this uh, interesting program that they call uh, student partnership program or something like that, where they're actually partnering uh, students, as you said, you know, students with faculty and the student is not an expert in education or in, but they're giving their feedback about the experience that is being designed. So they're giving their view as as students. When I started teaching at Université Laval in, a, in the high flex model, it was the first time that I taught three modalities at the same time. And I made, on, like it was on purpose that my TA was someone who really went through the, the commodal, went through this experience. And she was surprised that I was like, I, I need your feedback. And I was like, really, do you need my feedback? And I'm like, yeah, this is why I, we want, I want to collaborate with you because I have no idea about the expectations of students when they are in three different modalities and how things like, what are the different challenges? And, and I really need you to be the, the student's voice and listen to the students and really give me this perspective because I'm designing this course for the first time with three different modalities at the same time. And I want to make sure that I'm, I'm hearing what are the challenges from the other perspective, not from my perspective. But because of the emergency in the fall and the winter semester, and now we're talking even about three years, I've, I was in a, in a department meeting this, this morning, and we're talking about three years ahead, like now we're planning for it. We don't see any solutions soon. So how can these centers be able to really help all faculty members at the same time? Well, that's, that's actually where I was going to go next, because I think this issue of trying to build up excellent examples with key faculty is only one of a number of strategies. Probably the more important is to ask ourselves, what are the most important things that we want to advise and empower faculty to do as they make this full migration now onto 
Well, well, I'm sorry, given what I understand about COVID from my colleagues in the medical school, we are uh, in for about a three year stretch here, if we're lucky. Yeah. And that being the case, all courses are probably going to have to migrate in some form to online. So what's the most important thing that we can do that will support faculty in a way that reflects the resources we have and that they have, number one. Number two, that would give the biggest payoff to student learning and motivation, both. And number three, that are doable in a very short period of time. We have only, what, <laughs> a month or two here, basically, to go before courses are going to be rolling out. By the way, in similar cases where universities have had to go online quickly for some reason, it is possible to roll a course out piece by piece. It does not have to be completely finished by the time the semester begins. That's uncomfortable for a lot of faculty, but that's the reality here, I think, is that we try to think about an overall plan what are we going to, how are we going to modify what's already available in this course to make it as, as effective as possible given our resources and given time and resources right now? And how are we going to approach that for everybody in a way that gives as much support as we can? Yeah. So for me, the first question is, what are those things? I mean, what, what, what would make the biggest impact? And I know there's a lot of different opinions about this. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the whole, you know, the, um, I had some centers who were saying, we, we need to find a way to teach them to fish and not give them the fish, right? Because we really, and I was speaking with uh, with Tony Bates uh, the other day, and he was, so he's an expert in, in online learning. And he was saying that one of the problems, as you said at the beginning, is that our faculties, they don't have the background in education, like they don't have the knowledge, they're expert in their field. And in our PhD programs, we don't have this requirement where every student who might be actually going through, you know, like doing uh, teaching one day, uh, that they have some sort of, of training before they actually go and um, so this is a challenge. But now we are faced with these different professors who need to learn how they create their courses and design their courses and think about their courses with the interaction with with the, with the technology, and this is uh, this is one of the like this is this is the challenge that we're uh, we're having. The other thing is that I totally I I hundred percent agree with you about you know you don't have to have your course ready, the whole course ready. I never had my course ready. I have my course outline. But one of the things that I adopt in my courses is, is a total flexibility, and I explain this to my students from the beginning, from day one, is that. Um, this is the plan, but what we will be doing is really based on your needs and what I see is best fit for you and the things that will be changing. And I had some students who really appreciated that, but you have some students who need certainty and they need, and when the professor is um, flexible or not, you know, they, like they're not, they don't give this impression that they are certain about like this is A, B, C, D, and this is how we will do the wings things. They feel as if they don't know how to teach or they're not. So working with these perceptions, how, how can we deal with making sure that we're flexible, but at the same time, making sure that our students are not perceiving this as a lack of expertise, but actually really helping them reach the best, you know, like designing for them the best learning experience possible. Well, that's, you know, it's interesting because anxiety is not a fixed quality in people. It's some people are much more anxious than others. And highly anxious students want certainty. They want things organized, laid out very clearly, and they want to march through. Now, I don't think you can make everybody happy. I, 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 and particularly people that are extremely anxious on the one hand, or people that are extremely open to change and experience on the other and come to expect it. I think what we want to try for is somewhere halfway between, and that sort of calms both sides a bit. I, I'm not so concerned when, when students get upset because they don't have structure. My guess is the same students are always upset about the same issue, or the other way around. This course is too fixed. So I'm not so sure I'm really concerned about that. What I'm concerned about is how much are they learning? Yeah. How, how durable is that learning? Uh, what kind of instruction is leading to that learning? And if they have motivation issues, 
I don't find that anxiety, anxiety is one part of it. And if it's extremely important to students, if anxiety is interfering with their learning, we can't help them. Their, their help has to come from psychological support, from, a, you know, from, from therapy. Actually, I'm sorry, but that's, that's the issue for a lot of students. That's and cool. so I'm not so concerned. But that. you also have uh, professors who need also this certainty. They well, have always done this the thing that way, and now they're moving to uh, unfamiliar territory and unfamiliar experiences. If they have to change things on the way, they might also feel uncom feel uncomfortable un uncomfortable about that. So. How to you know, we, we, did, we did a study, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Burr Saxberg, who now works for the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Um, Burr and I did a study where we took a look in, a, in the largest online university in the world. We explored the best instructors they had. That is the people whose students learn more, continued in the program more reliably, and were happier with what they were experiencing. So we, we pulled out the best instructors we could find in different fields, and we did a, a task analysis, a cognitive task analysis of how they were teaching to try to find out what, was, what, what strategies were they using that had such amazing results. And, and the results were just, we were dumbfounded by the results. We had expected something different. You know what we found out? It was one, one factor. How empathetic were they perceived to be by students? Think about that. How concerned was that fact? How did they express their concern about, we know it's difficult for you, we know you've got challenges, and now, ever more important than it ever was before, we understand that you're stuck at home and that you don't have maybe the best internet connection all the time. We are going to do our best to try to accommodate you, or I am going to do my best as, as a faculty member. That was a huge benefit for those faculty. And by the way, we also found out something else that we didn't expect, which is they tended to bend rules for students sometimes. I mean, if in their view, a student had particularly tough time, for example, a lot of single parents uh, have always tried to do uh, online instruction for obvious reasons. You know, they're juggling family and home and so on. And, and basically, they were the ones that occasionally a faculty member would say, well, you missed a deadline, but okay, you've got a sick child. I really appreciate that. I'm not asking for a note from your doctor. I'll give you another week. How is that? And, and even though it was against the rules, that faculty member did it, and actually it made a huge difference to the student. More okay. of them succeeded with that. And they, that's, that take us to, um, takes us to uh, the whole equity thing, right? When, because equity is also another challenge that... Extremely important. You're, just, you're dealing with people who have not much experience with education, number one, and number two, with online, and who often are in communities whose internet connection is not always as good as you'd like it to. It goes on and on. You know, the, you know this routine. And so this being willing to be empathy, being willing to be flexible and empathetic, it makes all the difference. And here's the rub. A lot of very bright faculty are, how would I put this? They're not always terribly empathetic. Um, as a psychologist, I think of them as varying along a kind of a, a, a continuum of more or less empathetic. And the really low empathy people are kind of... They have a problem seeing the world through anybody else's eyes, particularly a student. So this is a challenge for some faculty, but those who master it, even those who learn to act empathetic who are not feeling that way, the result is pretty much the same. Hmm. Positive result, I'm saying. And how can teaching and learning centers uh, Encourage. Well, what is it? You can describe what does it mean to be empathetic? What behaviors are, are thought of as empathetic by students? And so it motivates them much more to work. It, it motivates them to work harder. It motivates them to be much more interested and positive about your course. And there are such things as, make mm -hmm. a list. Um, here, when you encounter a student who, where this is an issue, consider doing that. Uh, because those are, the, those are the things that have been found to be much more successful. We wrote something about this. I'll send it to you if I can find it. We did a, 
uh, a presentation at a conference. I can't remember whether we wrote an article on it. I think we did. I think we published something on it. I'll find it. But that, that's, that's, you know, if I had to mention one thing, we expected it would be an instructional strategy. They were better at demonstrations or they were, they were giving more effective feedback. That could, No, none of that. So that's interesting. Uh, to me, it still is interesting. As you're saying, like thinking about the human who, like our students are humans, right? Our faculty members are also human. So it's not, and one of the thing that the, again, the, the, the centers had to do because of the rush, they had to come up with all the different resources and share all the different messages. And really, you know, because things were happening super fast. And then many of them realized that what happened is that all these faculty members who were stressed and they wanted to know how to move online, they were following all these webinars. But at some time, at, at some point, they were fatigued, like they were exhausted about that and by the time they reached what they really needed it was too late because they were really now exhausted so they didn't think about the anxiety that these professors were really going through and how to give them what they needed instead of throwing everything towards them so because these guys are also going through the covid and they're you know the same stress that the whole world is going through these are going through that and on top of this, they have to make sure that their students are finishing the semester. So it's, when I talk about yeah. this, it's, it's everybody, heavy. everybody's it's affected heavy. by this. Yeah, it is. Absolutely. That's why I think we have to keep the number of things that we advise people to do to a minimum. I mean, for one thing, it's novel for, for too many. For another thing, we know that, you know, given what we understand about cognition, that overloading people with too much information is almost worse than not giving them enough. Absolutely. Uh, so what's a doable number of things that will have the greatest impact that we can then gradually add to later? And to me, it's less the technology itself, because that's kind of standard in a way. It has its limits, that's for sure. And ways to overcome limitations in an LMS system, for example, are very important. But I want to focus most of them on instructional strategies. And it doesn't mean they, some faculty don't have to change the way that they're teaching, I think. But those who substitute telling people things or lecturing for what I think of as instruction, those who don't think they have to actually demonstrate how to do something and give students the opportunity to practice it and get feedback for that practice, those are people that do need some support. I think. Yeah, absolutely. And and what you're saying, you know, and, and this is the this is the other um, worry and challenge is that now that they have these functionalities in the technology, that their design will be based on these functionalities. Like yeah. now, this is this is we know that we can do X, Y, and Z. So we're going to make sure that our lessons will be. We, and this like the chat room, for example, and rules about the chat room and how many you have to talk and, and all this. I mean, that makes almost no difference whatsoever. But those are the things that are focused on, as you say, because they're functionalities that are available. Yeah. Too bad. Okay, well, I think you can ignore those things, provided you can get people's attention on what does make a difference. And often that's the instructional strategies they build into their courses. Yeah. I hardly know where to start here. I mean, I've got my own ideas about what the biggest, I mean, I, Paul Kirshner and John Sweller and I wrote that piece on what we call fully guided instruction. And we did it because we, a few years back, we were all sitting together at a conference somewhere, realizing that we were being heckled by students who had come out of the Indiana University's program uh, and had been taught discovery learning. And they called us names, what they thought were critical names, like instructivists and so on. And we said, you know, we really owe it to ourselves to sit down and to write a piece. And if we had to make decisions on the most important things to be done in, in instruction that would have the biggest payoff on learning and transfer and performance later and so on, what would it be? And we really, and we said, we're from different countries. We have different psychologies in these different countries, and we want to make sure that whatever we say represents a fairly international point of view about the evidence is gathered in different cultures, different countries, and so on. And so we wrote that piece on what we call fully guided instruction. 
And our point was, no matter what you do, you absolutely have to demonstrate to people step by step how to do what you expect them to be able to do after they've been, after they've learned what it is you have to teach them. And so this guiding step by step, uh, keeping in mind what their prior knowledge is, not to give them information they don't need, but not to force them to make mistakes and therefore discover what they don't know, if possible. And that we felt was the most critical thing. And while they're guided, they also need practice opportunities. So full guidance, practice, and during that practice, they really need feedback. They need corrective feedback, not on whether they're right or not, but whether the strategy they're using is working or not. Focusing everything on strategy, not on the student as being right or wrong. Those three things, I think, are what we settled on as most important. Um, we got more negative reaction than anybody's ever had to an article and, and research for a very long time. And now people have come around. I mean, generally, all of the reactions and the arguments and so on are at an end. And I really think that people have more or less bought into that argument that we made, except for the diehard discovery learning people. And there's quite a few of them out there. I, uh, I adopt the, the problem-based learning approach in, uh, in my courses at some level. But when I, was, when I was first introduced to it, I was teaching it in a, in a program where they really ad adopted it at almost 100%. And I, I couldn't take it for 100%. Because as you said, that sometimes you, you have to give clear instructions. So it was more of a mixed approaches mixed models that i you know so based uh, and again based on your students and based on the context and based on what you're trying to teach and based on what the the, the, the learning that you're trying to facilitate but um, yeah instruction and, and it, it was interesting because this in this program the teaching was um, prohibited like we need to talk about facilitating learning which i found very interesting right because it really puts the, um, the instructor as you know no, no longer the, the sage on the stage but actually a member of this group and co-constructing uh, knowledge together but at some place i had to be the expert and i had to give clear instructions for my students because without that they were really lost and i would have lost the whole experience and the whole you know everything that they needed to learn and a lot of my teaching happens through feedback so it's, it's really a lot of fit because they need that. So I, I, I totally agree with you. Technology, the, the definition of the term technology is science and practice applied to the solving of problems. It's like engineering in a way. And if it's not science-based, it's not technology. It's not educational technology. And it worries me that most educational technology programs are not science-based. I mean, in my view, they're not. They're not with faculty that actually know much about research or even some people who are hostile about it, for example. And so I think we have to have science as a basis for everything we do when it's there. Yeah. And by the way, it's not because we don't know about it doesn't mean that it's not there. Yeah, absolutely. And, and because we haven't done a good idea in trying to suss out what the best work is and make it Make it available in a, in a consumable form by a variety of people. That's missing. That's, that's really one of our biggest mistakes, is not translating what we've done in research in a way that's effective for people that want to use it. And then be able to point out examples of it that are functioning, that are ideal, and so on. And one of the, some of the things that are happening in science, we're not talking about, which I find really a problem. For example, that if we use the wrong instructional strategy with students online or in the classroom, they can end up instruction knowing less about a topic than they did before they started, significantly less. I, I set out to find studies where pretest scores were significantly lower than or higher than post-test scores in courses. And I found 70 different studies in a huge variety of ages and types of disciplines and so on, where students actually knew significantly less after they'd been taught than they did before in some subject, when the instructional methods that were being used were not working for them, actually worked against 
their knowledge. And I think people in education feel they can do no harm. I think we have a sense that when we don't succeed, it's neutral and we can try again. But that's not true. Yeah. When we don't succeed, we've often, what, what profession avoids doing harm? Every profession can cause problems. Absolutely. Why should we assume that we're the only one that can't with what we do? Absolutely. And this is, that was one of the challenges also with online learning, because now you have so many bad experiences that people are against, and they're already yep. entering the courses with the yep. assumption that we learn nothing or we're wasting our time. or what. So right. It's or, terrible. It's, that is a complication that nobody appreciates that hasn't been involved in this. You know, people's first experience of something as complex as online learning colors their impression of it for, for often for years. Even when they see good examples, they tend to think of them as outliers, as rare, and not as, as common at all. And they blame the online part for the problem. When it's not having anything to do with online, but how it's presented and how it's used, not how it can be used. So this, this is a huge problem. But you know what? I think a lot of those things are less important now, given that everybody's going to have to be doing it. We have to do the best job we can with the resources we have. So what is it that's going to make the biggest difference? That's, I think, what anybody in your position or in the centers have to determine. What are we going to focus on as the thing that we know will give the greatest support to both the students and to the faculty who we're supporting? And then Focus on those things and how to do them in online instruction. Yeah. That's the best I can offer. Uh, it's not going to be everything. You know, we created that checklist I sent, yeah. not as a way to embarrass anybody, but as a way to uh, let faculty go through and say, well, I would like to do number one, number 18, and number 27 in my course. I'd like to be able to achieve those goals. And my answer is, terrific. Let's go for it. And then maybe the next time we go through a revision cycle, which is maybe as soon as we can, maybe then you'll pick some other things. And eventually we'll ask, well, why can't we do most of these things? Because you can't implement them all at once. And I think you'll find no course that represents all of those things. But every one of those items is evidence-based. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even when in a normal time, when you recreate a course, it, it doesn't, like, you need to do it the first time and, you know, pilot your stuff and, you know, see your students' reactions and then modify yeah. it. it. It it will never be the, bet, like, the excellent, the best version from the first time that you do it. So how about this, in, in, in this very, uh, very challenging, challenging period? I've had, I've heard people say that one of the most difficult things they encountered when they first started to teach online, they couldn't see their students. They, they couldn't see their reactions. And they realized how much in the classroom or even in a lecture hall, they depended on monitoring students' facial and, and nonverbal reactions to what was going on. That's not there anymore. And, but I actually tell them that if all the studies of faculty that now are talking about uh, higher education, not K-12, but in higher ed, Faculty tend to focus only on their best students. I'm sorry, not their best, but their most receptive, their most uh, enthusiastic. With the body students language. Who are giving them eye contact, you know, and so on, and who are smiling and who are obviously listening. And they're not focusing on those who are sort of maybe more distant and so on. But still, I think that is perceived to be one of the biggest issues here. So I always think if you can put anything into effect that has a clicker kind of thing, where, where faculty can occasionally put in, well, what do you think? Is it A, B, or C? And they can click, and then there's a dashboard on the screen that shows what reactions they got. Those things tend to be substitutes for being able to actually eyeball students and get a sense of how they're reacting to things. Yeah, absolutely. When I was when you were talking about the the, the, the first experience um, and how it stick really like the first experience, even if it's uh, even if you have many good experience after. When I did my PhD project, I was looking at the um, the, the, the perception of uh, I was I was working on that that was during the, the, the 
Syrian refugee crisis. And I was looking at how the different perceptions about refugees could affect the, the inclusion and the integration of, of, uh, of these new, um, new like the refugees in their host societies. And my participants were really um, the host society youth. So they were 18 to 24 years old. When I was speaking with them and I was telling them, you know, like things that were shared online, you have maybe one person who, let's say, said something bad about refugees. And then that was after that, you know, you have many people who were supporting refugees online. And my youth, the 24 to 18 to 24, they said one word that hurts, it hurts much deeper than many good like this is what sticks and this you know if you have one word that hurts you will never forget it even if you have many positive words after that this is what sticks and this is what you live with so similar to you know bad experience because you you have all the emotions and you have all the the perceptions that you develop because of this bad experience and you don't want to go through it again and it happened once so why not it, the possibility that it would happen again it's out there right so sometimes you don't want to risk it you don't want to be hurt you don't want to waste your time you don't want to you know pay for a course you know that especially in this time where we have a lot of like it's it's heavy life is now heavy for many of our students with all the responsibilities that they have so having to go through another experience where they're wasting their time they're maybe taking money out of their family to pay for their tuition or all of that so is it worth it so this is so why to me, this, is, this becomes even more reason to do an evidence base to, to focus on, because there, there's good evidence about feedback that faculty give. There's, there's a great series of studies on feedback, and one of the things we learned in those studies is that one-third of all of the feedback that faculty give actually makes things worse, <laughs> because that feedback includes this one word or this one experience that so hurts a student. That, that's all they remember. And that colors the entire experience of the course for them. And that's, that's 30%. Another third makes no difference whatsoever. It doesn't help. It doesn't hurt. So it's a waste of time. Only one third of the types of feedback the faculty give actually make a difference. Faculty generally don't know about that. Good teachers do. They come up on it kind of by instinct or by accident, by being open to learn but mostly they don't. And it's a simple piece of advice on one level. And the piece of advice is don't ever give feedback that's focused on the student. Yeah. Feedback has to always be focused on the, the strategy they're using or the task that they've selected or something that's external to the student. Don't characterize them as wrong or right. ignorant or stupid or whatever it is, because that's what they're going to think when you say they're wrong say, wait, you know, uh, that's part of the strategy that you were using. Maybe we could edit that. How, how might it be done differently if you're going to adopt a more Socratic way to deal with the issue? That has huge impact, very positive. Yeah, I remember the first time I TA'd um, and I had to give feedback to students. I was, you know, like I was super excited and I'm trying, you know, adding all my comments. And at that time, the professor who was also my my um, my, my supervisor, she, uh, she said, listen, whatever you're giving them, it's really very relevant. You know, I was telling them, do this, do that. Da, da, da. She said, add a word, like add, consider doing this, consider doing like just with them, you know, instead of asking them to do stuff, ask them to consider maybe. So the way you're structuring your feedback would have like, put yourself in the shoes of these students who worked super hard on their assignments and now they're receiving this harsh feedback, despite the fact that it's very constructive, but how they're perceiving this, how they are reading this, that would make- And you know, this is, a, this is a perfect issue to go back to something else we talked about, which is students are more anxious and less anxious. Yeah. Telling them to do something is perfect for the anxious student, but it, uh, not for the student who's more independent-minded. They want to be said, well, consider doing this. Think about your alternatives, but it might be better if you tried it anyway. That works for them. But again, if you do it that way, it's not maybe going to work so much for the other. Here's the advice I've had that helps. Do it both ways. 
the evidence is that people will hear what it is they want to hear, more or less. So if you say, do it this way, and well, or those of you that have any resistance to that, you might consider trying it. And the combination of the two will be carried away in positive way by people at both ends of the continuum. I think we are, to some extent, really trying hard to give people a message that will be most effective for them, that will work for them. And that means huge diversity in people's outlook. And then we have issues about race and about culture that are so critical. And, and the way that sometimes we choose to think we're doing it in a kind way is not kind at all, it turns out. And, but we've learned so much more about ways to do that. And uh, I think, again, the question is, what's the evidence about what works best for those people? Not for us as instructors or as designers, but for students that we're trying to support. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and communication is one also key challenge that the centers raised. Uh, they were saying that many times they, they did an error, like how they communicated with, whether with, with faculty or with, you know, because they had to interact with all different entities within the university. So understanding how to communicate in time of crisis and how to send the message and how to, especially with faculty, you don't, you, you can't be a top down thing. It has to come from their needs and you have to, make them you know trust you and feel that you're actually listening to their needs and you're giving them what they need if you impose something on them that will cause another you know a barrier between you and them helping them so um absolutely you know how you're you're delivering your message is very 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 it's it's very sensitive there's one other issue i want to raise that changes the topic slightly anyway and that is what is it most difficult to do online that may be most important and really important in learning. And it strikes me that that is to um, have students actually try to practice something, mm -hmm. to implement what they've seen demonstrated or heard demonstrated, and to try then to do something for themselves that's important and to be observed while they're doing it and be given feedback. See, I think to learn a lot of things, I think feedback has to happen while you're doing, while you're practicing, while you're trying to apply what you've seen. Not a week later or a month later. I mean, we know as knowledge, as we begin to learn knowledge, if it's, if it's knowledge about how to do something, we eventually have to automate it. it can't, it's not going to be conscious after a while. We have to do it over and over again until it's not conscious. But at first, it's very conscious. And if we, if we make wrong steps in learning how to do something complex, we're going to have to overcome those wrong steps later. It's kind of like when you're introduced to a person for the first time and you mishear their names, and rather than Janet, we say Janice, and then, oh my gosh, from then on, that person is Janice until we remember that we said it wrong. So it's the same with learning how to do complex things in areas like engineering, I mentioned chemistry, laboratory courses in the sciences, in, uh, certainly in education because it involves how to teach, how to, how to do all kinds of things. And I think that's our big challenge. I don't think we have, I don't think we can do uh, synchronous instruction for a huge number of students easily. So there we've got to do some very careful thinking about how we accomplish that. And if we ever trust getting students into universities again. My guess is that we ought to be putting them in the laboratories or in the settings where they actually can be observed as they try to apply what they've learned and demonstrate that they now know how to do something that's fairly complex. Well, you know, I'm, I'm starting to be committed to artificial intelligence <laughs> I, in the design process. I, I'm I'm of a mind that designers ought to spend their time trying to solve problems that we haven't solved uh, because it just adds another human element in the whole sequence of things that has to happen before an effective class can get online. I see the future of instructional design as being primarily an AI issue. Um, I have a grant right now to develop an AI version of cognitive task analysis. 
And we're in the first year of that project. And I think it's going to take us easily three years. And I'm not even sure what we're going to end up with at the end of that time. But task analysis is a really critical part of what we do. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that's something that almost never gets done in universities. Uh, the, the faculty member is assumed to have already done task analysis, and very few of them have, actually, or even would know what it was if you described it. So uh, it's, all design and development work could eventually be automated in a, in a sense that it could be automated in a way that it could be changed as we learn more and learn different things and get feedback. That's number one. And number two, I'm impressed with the learning analytic people and what they're doing. But I'm very unimpressed with their inclination to think that nobody's ever asked the question that they want to ask in the past. I mean, they they act as if there's no psychology there, that there's no education there, that they're going to discover both over again. And I'm not over, I don't think I'm overestimating. Uh, We just finished a book uh, out now on, on, uh, active le- on, on uh, big data and, and data mining. And one of the biggest criticisms that we had to offer in the book is all of the examples of no prior thought about any science that had developed over time before it reached the point where we can actually look at what the keystrokes are for 10,000 students who are in the same MOOC at the same time, for example. But that's going to make a huge difference. And by the way, to me, it ought to be a parallel process with what we're doing to help faculty get into the classroom. I mean, at the same time, we can be looking at, on a very broad, very large scale, at what's working and what's not working, both in terms of at given university and between universities for courses that are shared, for example. So, and by the way, begin to talk to other universities about actually sharing courses. I know this is heresy. Take a course like statistics for crying out loud. How many universities have a basic course in statistics and education? Thousands of them. Yeah. Is that a good expenditure of scarce resources? No. It's arrogance on the part of universities to think they have the best course, but it's possible actually to build some core courses and share them and invest our efforts somewhere else. But this is not this year's problem. It's not this year's solution. But uh, w- one, of the, uh, one of the initiatives bec- to, to, to help professors actually develop their courses quickly and, and in a, an efficient way, uh, uh, Ottawa University, so University, uh, Ottawa University and um, Carleton University in Ontario, they have this, uh, they initiated this program where uh, professors from two different universities can work on the same course okay. and it, this is shared between them. And I found this, that, that was really clever. Like this is brilliant. To actually you know, uh, the Annenbergs, I think that those money people here in the United States gave millions of dollars uh, in potential grants if universities would do this in the United States. It failed. Ah. They actually had to change the requirements of the money to give it away because so, much, so few universities actually would agree to collaborate on a course that they both would offer credit for. How's that for crazy? It has something to do with maybe the, you know, the United States system. I don't know. But it was one of the great failures. Now, it was a number of years ago that that happened. Maybe the results would be different today. But certainly the people that granted that money were very unhappy about not having any takers. So. One, of the, one of the things, because I, I asked these guys um, the, the, when they were sharing about the initiative, I was like, okay, but how, how did you how did you really encourage professors to share, right? Because sometimes it's, it's difficult to, to encourage people to share. And some of the researchers were actually happy about the initiative because they had maybe some researchers they wanted to work with in another university and didn't have the chance to work with before. So that actually oh, opened the door for further, you know, like other collaborations. Well, so we'll take any, the incentive. In, any incentive is a good incentive to do exactly. this, I would say. And that's actually a huge benefit, too, if it makes a collaboration where one didn't exist before. So that's that's something I hadn't thought of as a possible uh, offshoot of this, but that's a great way to to convince people to try it. All these things will come along in time. Um, I, you know, I would hope that we could find ways to share between universities what our most effective strategies have been in helping faculty get into the online thing. Absolutely. I mean, for example, I know of universities that have produced little presentations for them, both video and on, you know, uh, overheads and this sort of thing, where basically say, 
here's a series of things that you can do as you're, the term that's often used is migrating your course from classroom to online. And here's the resources that you can call on. And as we list the resources, we're going to give you all the information you need, how to get in touch with people who can help you. So the first thing you need to think about is, and then the second thing is, and the third thing is, and so on. And those things are very helpful, I think, because they, they, they give faculty a sequence to go through if they're inclined. And as a matter of fact, for a lot of faculty, it's set up so that it, it's not a suggestion. It's here's the minimum of what we're asking you to do and how you can get it done. Beyond that, there's much more that you can do. And here's some ideas about what they are and how you'd get resources to do it. But at least we need to ask you to do these things and expect that. And I understand that some universities are making it part of faculty contracts now. You know, in the United States, um, private universities sign new contracts with faculty every year, which is kind of interesting. And that allows the university to change the conditions of their employment and allows the faculty to say yes or no and if they're tenured, then you have an argument, of course. Uh, but if they're not tenured, they're going to have to fall in line. So I think it's helpful. And I have seen some of those, but I'd like to see a whole lot more of them. I guess kind of an acceptance of what is it that is most important as an indicator of the success? What's our goal? What's our objective? Take that uh, gap analysis model that you and I both like, I think, and ask ourselves, where are we going with this? What's most important to, uh, as an outcome? Is it student learning and performance? Is it student satisfaction and belief that they've had a great experience? Is it faculty satisfaction with what they've done? Um, is it that we uh, are succeed at implementing what we think is best, what our instinct tells us? I mean, there are a number of different possibilities, but if we don't start with one or more of them, we're not going to get any place. Are our students oh. being able to be uh, to find the job and really performing when they they get their internship? Okay, this now is that like, I'm, for I'm, me. I'm, for me, this is what I want to you know. This I want to make sure that whatever everybody. I'm doing in my classroom, it's something that would be super useful to them and they will actually, you know, go back to that and use it and be something that, you know. So I was me, this amazed. Is my... I, was, I was amazed to look at some of the evidence that came up with the uh, uh, with some of the, the, the work groups that are out there that are very well funded to ask these questions. And what actually works is surprising sometimes, I think. That is what actually helps students get jobs, for example. Yeah. And, and there are things that universities are not doing. You know, for example, ramping up the investment and placement, for example. They, they need to do that. But whatever it is, we track back from there and ask, how far are we from that? What, what, how are we? You know, it's the old thing. Let's do that. And when we do... How much, how important is it going to be when you get to the point of why aren't we there? Yeah. What's the cause? And we don't jump to a conclusion that if we only did what we did before, what we like or what we expect will work, but what we do is that actually works, that's been shown to work. And then the question becomes, okay, how do we implement it in this environment and so that it will be effective here? Because now there's issues about culture and language and expectations and resistances and personality, a whole lot of other things that we have to consider. But that evidence piece, if it's not there, and if we ignore it as a possibility of deciding that that's a big part of what will close this gap, then we've lost at the beginning of the process. And you know what we found out when we studied gap analysis? It always, if it fails, it almost always fails when people are trying to discover the cause of the gap. It's like they already know what caused it and what will close it before they get there. And to stop and say, maybe I don't know, maybe it's something quite different, maybe it's even something I've rejected in the past, yeah. that's where the challenge comes. Yeah. This is one of the things that we discuss and like I discuss in my classes with my ed techers, it's our bias, right? Because we enter in and we think that we know because we, you know, and this is a huge, huge, uh, huge, um, how can we say that in, in English? 
not a risk. This is a threat. Well, it's a barrier to people yeah, exactly. learning anything new. Exactly. I've come to the same conclusion. I, I tell people when I'm working in, as an instructor in ed tech that the biggest mistake we can make is to assume everybody is like us. Guess what? They're not. <laughs> you know, even though they look like you and talk like you even, that doesn't mean they are actually like you. And so you have to be curious about who are they and what are they like in a way that's going to help you support them to achieve their goals and the goals of the university, which is that they succeed at the university and that they get good jobs after that and are productive in the society they live in.